This is a program special concerning the days of the big ban. When George Arrestus of the Maine Lottery Commission was with us some time back, we briefly touched upon his career in showbiz and his day with, days with the Fenton Brothers Maine Band. And on that cue, we suggested a program dealing with this bit of nostalgia. And George agreed to come back for a bit of discussion on the subject. Today is the day, and George Arrestus is with us, ready and willing to brush some of the cobwebs aside to consider that period of history when big bands was a way of life. For our listeners, this morning's program provides opportunity to join in discussion as we make way with the talkback telephone here at 623-3878. George, conceivably, there are those out there who never at any time have heard of the Fenton Brothers Band and were perhaps mystified that we should mount such a show. The basic question is such to begin our program this morning, who were the Fenton Brothers and what kind of a music did they make on the road? Well, the Fenton Brothers originally were two... Uh, men, uh, Joe Labrie, who was the lead saxophone player, and George Arrestus, who was the leader, who had started out as a drummer and then took composing, conducting, and arranging lessons from Rupert Neely in Portland, a very famous man. He, he uh, trained the Medi Bemsters uh, at Bowdoin College for many years and was well known. Uh, we picked a name out of the telephone book, and we became, instead of Orestes Labrie, which would have been all right when you stop to consider uh, Engelbert Humperdinck, Dink <laughs> as a, you know, as a name. Um, so we became the Fenton Brothers. And uh, just f for a bit of local nostalgia, we played the Eureka Ballroom, which is opposite Coney High School. Admission was 25 cents. We only had eight men. We came from Lewiston in, the, in cars. In those days, uh, early days of radio, uh, we ran a, a, a single telephone line from Portland into the DeWitt Hotel in Lewiston. There were no radio stations, which brings me to your radio station and to the to the one in Lewiston. The, the, the WFAU was for Faust Couture, FAU Faust, and Mr. Couture's father owned the Le Messager, the French newspaper, and WCOU in, in Lewiston uh, was for Couture. So he started two radio stations, and I, here I am sitting in one of them. All and right. we, we opened the Lewiston station in 1936 with a, with a concert by, with, by my band, which at that time numbered 14. Uh, the Fenton Brothers started out in the Lewiston area and soon spread out into the Central Maine area. Our most famous stand for 11 years from 1930 to 1941, 1931 to 42, when I went off to war uh, in the Central Maine area was Island Park, which was owned by Bill Williamson. He, he owned the state and the Capitol theaters here in Augusta. We danced a thousand people a night. And we were on percentage, and uh, he was a marvelous gentleman. He became Freddie Payne's administrative assistant in Washington, D.C., and uh, we never had a contract. We just shook hands every spring, and he'd say, well, how much are you going to cost me this year? Because the band kept expanding, we wound up with 18 men on the stand. It was a marvelous era, uh, era and I think uh, I regret that the youngsters didn't have the thrill of walking into a ballroom, such as at Old Orchard, or even in our case, to see our band, uh, the youngsters, all they know mostly today is the guitar setup, but to walk in and see a Paul Whiteman or a Rudy Valley with uh, 20, 25 people in the stand and Alice Faye singing, and, and to see Rudy himself, who had been a house band a musician, at all, musician at all Orchard, and to see him become world famous with the Stein song and working the Hi-Ho Club in New York and the Villa Valley and have a special, uh, the train stop, uh, uh, the Pine Tree Limited was held over in Grand Central Station so Rudy could come up on Thursday nights after his Fleischmann yeast hour. All of that is missed, I think, by the youngsters. They've seen so much on television. They've seen it all, mm -hmm. uh, so that they're rather jaded, and there's nothing hardly to thrill anybody. But it was a great thrill to see Cab Calloway walk in and see this Heidi Ho guy um, with a big band, something you'd never heard in person before, and that sound really washed over you. And ultimately, uh, rather than the uh, Lawrence Welks and the Guy Lombardos, who played mostly melody and was very, the music was very recognizable, to wind up with a Stan Kenton with five trumpets and five trombones and five melophoniums and six saxophones and hear a sound that's a, that can be acquired no other way except to have this particular orchestration and arranging uh, wash over you. It was a tremendous thrill. Would you say the 1930s, the mid, uh, the late 1930s, was really the apex of this whole period? Oh, absolutely. I worked at that time, uh, uh, Joe and I worked for Charlie and Cy Shribman out of the uh, State Ballroom in Boston on Mass Avenue. And he had Claude Thornhill, the Shribmans did, uh, had Claude Thornhill, they had Glenn Miller, they had Artie Shaw, and we were the junior band out of New England. And um, that was, I think, the top era between about 1938 when Goodman came on with Sing, Sing, Sing and with Krupa and the drummers and the marvelous individual uh, 
um, uh, instrument leaders, Benny Goodman and Tommy Dorsey and Jimmy Dorsey and Miller in front with, uh, with his trombone. That was the era that really sold millions of records, millions, millions of albums, and they had a style and, a, and an appearance that was just marvelous. It was very glamorous, as a matter of fact. Uh, they played the theater circuits. They also played uh, the Manhattan Room, the Pennsylvania Hotel, and, and places like that. The, uh, um, uh, Ray Noble came over from England and wore the full dress uh, uh, tuxedo. You know, it was just marvelous to see some of these people, and uh, they produced music that, that 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 lasts even today. You can buy the stock arrangements, the big stocks, which are the big sheets of music, which. Uh, Al Corey still uses. Uh, uh -huh. You can you can buy those. But in in those days, uh, an arrangement of Song of India, for instance, by Tommy Dorsey, or uh, In the Mood by Glenn Miller, uh, sold millions of copies. One O'clock Jump, which uh, had started with uh, Count Basie, but uh, both uh, Goodman and Harry James took over. Two O'clock Jump. Uh, was uh, was the Fenton, were the Fenton brothers emulating any particular style of any of the big orchestras? Well, by that time, by by 1940, we had our own arranger, uh, Ben Homer, who wrote the the songs "Got a, a Sentimental Journey," "Going to Take a Sentimental Journey," was our staff arranger, uh -huh. and uh, uh, we tried not to emulate anyone, but it was hard it was hard not to. Uh, the famous Glenn Miller sound with the clarinet lead on top had been had been used by the Castle Loma Orchestra ten years before, but people had forgotten it. But it came uh, like a moonlight serenade. It became a trademark for those people. Well, um, with the same, actually, instrumentation that Miller had, we sounded quite a lot like it, and we could play their arrangements. So as junior members of the big league, let's say, because yeah. we wound up in New York at the Hotel Edison and the Hotel Lincoln, we played the Arcadia and the Roseland ballrooms both, and we went as far west as the... Uh, the Trianon Ballroom on Euclid Avenue in uh, in Cleveland, Ohio. That's as far west as we ever got on the circuit. We worked for Music Corporation of America, but we did sound. You know, I we had some test records that we made for Decca uh, that are lost now because when we four brothers, my my three brothers and myself went off to war, my mother packed that stuff up and left it in the cellar in the house we were living in. Uh, was cleaned out one day by a junk man and he threw all oh. our precious things away, and I regret that deeply. Nevertheless, we, uh, we did cut some uh, test records for Decca, and we did sound like the big band because it was inevitable. Almost. What happened with this connection with Decca? Apparently, it never did get to, the, to that point where they are going to start releasing them. Well, the war came, and uh, you know the first draft took out uh, four of my men uh, in the first draft, and uh, it was inevitable that we, we knew it was coming. And I, at the time, we were in Cleveland, and uh, I talked it over with my parents, and they said, look, how long are you going to be on the road? Inevitably, the world is, you know, the world's on fire. What are you going to do? And I really didn't know what to do to stay on and, and last as long as I could. But it, I came home and enlisted in the 103rd, and the band uh, just fell apart because it had to. All the guys were going. And uh, as a matter of fact, I lost three men in the war. Uh, Leonard Atchison, my guitar player, was one. He was out of Auburn, a marvelous musician, and uh, he was killed, uh, unfortunately and sadly in England in, 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 a, in an air raid and mm -hmm. uh, uh, that kind of thing really uh, kind of killed the spirit of the, of the musicians. Miller, however, uh, in Toto with his whole band was drafted into the Air Force and he, uh, he rejuvenated some of the stuffy old music they were playing in those days. For instance, the St. Louis, Blues, St. Louis Blues March came because Miller said, hey, let the guys march to something they recognize and, and really uh, he, he had concerts out in battlefields at the back of the battle scene sometime. My brother John was in France by then with General Omar Bradley as in a perimeter guard, and uh, uh, he remembers very vividly, as a matter of fact, Freddie Guerra, who was the third saxophone player in my band, was playing third saxophone for the Miller Band, and they met, they met in a battlefield in, in, uh, in France, and Miller was doing concerts over there. But he took the whole band into the, into the Air Force, and it was marvelous because he could keep them together. Uh -huh. um, it was an era of very unusual times. Uh, the dance, uh, immediately after the war, you were better off to manage a voice, a single personality. I give you Perry Como, for instance, and his song, Prisoner of Love, and uh, some of those people, um, rather than have the big band. Interest kind of fell off after the war. The kids didn't learn to dance, and uh, by the time Elvis came along, God rest his soul, uh, in 1952-53, um, music had moved away from the big band sound, and uh, the attrition had began to take place. Um, several of the big bands uh, remained, 
but it wasn't the same anymore. Yeah. The, the dance halls fell apart. Island Park is gone, for instance. Yes. You know, something was lost. Let's hold it just a moment. I want to come back to what it was like life on the road with the big bands. Right now, we're going to take a brief break. Let me remind you again that George Arrestus is with us today. George Arrestus remembers the days of the Fenton Brothers Band. We'll be back in just a moment. Our program this morning, George Arrestus remembers the days of the Fenton Brothers Band. Again, let me remind our listeners, any of you who'd like to join us with question, a comment this morning, the telephone lines are available, 623-3878. George, how was it, what was it like to be on the road? Was it a, was it kind of a, a, a life that was just agitated and you really had to keep up with it all the time? It must have been a terrific thing. Yes, indeed. Uh, the booking offices tried to, tried to line up your, your, your one-night stand so that the jumps wouldn't be too bad. But the worst one we ever did, uh, and it was in February, we jumped, we were playing the Hendrick Hudson Hotel in, uh, in, uh, uh, in Albany, New York. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the booking ended on a Saturday, a Sunday night, as I recall, and we were due in Caribou, Maine, in the middle of the, uh, for their winter carnival, for Wednesday of that week. And in those days, and I have, I, I was a, always been a camera addict, in those days, um, let me tell you how primitive it sounds, you know, like back to the Indian times, but it wasn't. Um, <laughs> but there was single, almost a, uh, just a two-way road, uh, say, from Presque Isle North. You could lose your life in a snowstorm up in Caribou. I have a, a movie of the, um, of the school bus in Caribou. We stayed at the New Corey Hotel. It's still there, by the way. I visited with the, with the lottery. And uh, we, I've, I've got a movie of, the, of how they delivered the children in winter by sled, and it looks like a covered wagon, and it's literally got a stove with a black stovepipe sticking out of the, out of the covered wagon canvas, if you will, with a single horse drawing uh, this school bus, which is a sled. Mm -hmm. Now, that sounds primitive as all get out, but it, it really wasn't. World War II was on. We knew it was going to happen. And we were on the road, and we kind of held out. After 1940, we knew something was going to happen that was terrible. But on the other hand, uh, you went, uh, we, uh, in the summertime, let me give you the schedule that we had of one-nighters. We played uh, Twin Mountains, New Hampshire on Monday. We played Intervale, New Hampshire on Tuesday. Island Park here in Augusta, Wednesday and Saturday. Thursday at the jack o in South Portland, and Friday at Lakewood. At, and it was great fun, really. And uh, you made a lot of friends. They looked for you, uh, forward to seeing you every week. We had new arrangements. We'd rehearse once a week, say, on a Wednesday morning. And uh, uh, you made a lot of friends. And those, some of those friendships la have lasted through the years. People still write cards and uh, say hello, and it's great fun. That's one of the things I was going to ask you. You still hear people who, who uh, ask you about the days of the, the Fenton Brothers? Absolutely. You know, people still write and send Christmas cards. Uh, uh, we played all the legislature dances here in the days of Governor Barrows, for instance, uh, which was before before World War II. Um, life uh, was mostly out of, if you were on the road, steady. Now, the summer circuit, we could go back home almost every night except Monday and Tuesday. But life on the road in one night is you lived out of a suitcase. Mm -hmm. Everything was packed in a certain way in the cars or in the bus. Uh, you had uh, you had work people who set up the band. It took an hour and a half. We had a we had a lot of we had a ton and a half of equipment, and with stands and flood lamps and sound system. I had a sound system in those days with five microphones, which was unheard of. It had cost a lot of money. A man named uh, Clarence York had built it for us out of Portland, and when we set up, people were quite amazed. But we had copied Rudy who had come to New Auburn after the New Auburn fire, which destroyed half the town. And we had seen this sound system set up. Rudy had started out with megaphones. He had a very weak voice right into how to succeed. They had to tie a microphone to him, hidden yeah. on him, yeah. because of his weak voice. But uh, he was a marvelous man. Uh, but we had a great sound system, and it took it took an hour and a half to set up the band. Sometime in the meantime, we changed out in the wings. <laughs> we yeah. I played I played. I remember the Franklin uh, uh, Fire uh, Fireman's Ball, and the hall was cold and drafty, and they hadn't they hadn't heated it er early enough. And we changed in the wings with no water uh, available. You know, after a, an all day trip from somewhere else. I remember that very vividly. We were changing in the wings, and the guys were saying, Gee, we're going to freeze. How are we going to play? <laughs> but uh, that was part of the life. But the other part of it was that you, you saw a lot of the country. We played Energetic Park up in Auburn, New York, near Skinny Adelies. And we saw we went from there to Niagara Falls. It made possible some things that wouldn't have been available any other way. George, you know, I you can only think back from what you're saying here that it must have been kind of a carefree time of existence as opposed to what... Do you, do you feel that this is true, that it was a carefree, as opposed to today where we're, we seem to be so uptight about so many things? Yes, it was kind of a... I think the word is a more innocent time. 
although we had come through the era, and I'm an old man, I'm, I'm 64, my next birthday, and I remember the St. Valentine's Massacre, and we were horrified by some of those things. But it wasn't so, it did not seem to be as prevalent throughout all of society. As I said, it was a more innocent time, people danced, uh, and it was a dance with a girl. It was mm -hmm. not the solo dance that you see today. Uh, in fact, one of the jokes was, one youngster says to the other, hey, I found a new, new dance, you hold the girl. <laughs> and that seems to be coming back, by the way, ballroom dancing. Uh, but uh, the jitterbugging and all that was k kind of a carefree time. And if, if you recall scenes at the end of World War I in Times Square, people were hugging and kissing each other. Uh, the, the drug scene wasn't so prevalent through all our school systems, which, uh, which of course, is a great uh, uh, responsibility and care for us these days because it, I understand that it's even in the junior high schools, you know, the youngsters are getting into it. But, uh, and we heard about, you know, drug dens in New York where the Chinese maybe were using some hashish or something. Cocaine, yeah. exactly. Yeah. None of that seemed to exist in those days, but uh, I'm sure it was there. But you had your problems too. I, I oh, think sure. it was the depression. We were oh, at the end of boy. the depression area, and everybody, you know, everybody had a few oh, uh, a few yes. shekels in the pocket. But you know, and probably they were saving them up to go to Island Park on a Saturday night, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, I get a kick out of um, my nephews and nieces getting a five dollar allowance to spend <laughs> when uh, you know a dollar was a great. It, it cost you a dollar at Old Orchard, dollar ten. And if you went early, you saw a movie, and then you saw the big band for a dollar yeah. and uh, again uh, the, the uh, you know, haircut for 35 cents uh, today it costs you seven dollars in some places to ten dollars if you tip the the barber or the hair uh, dresser nevertheless people came we were on one-nighters um, the big bands were on one-nighters uh, it, it was uh, you were as likely to see Jimmy Lunsford or uh, or uh, Glenn Miller uh, on a certain Wednesday night and you planned on it it was a thrill because there was no television there wasn't any, and, and the only way you got to see some of these marvelous attractions were to, was to go in person and to walk into the hall and see some of these uh, these presentations. And they, we worked uh, the Keith's uh, uh, theater circuit for a while. Uh, was to go to a theater and see three shows a day if you wanted to stay over see a sec see it a second time and see a Glenn Miller or see a Benny Goodman. Now um, uh, these bands burst on the scene. Uh, and it was different from the jazz uh, units, for instance. I give you the Louis Armstrong smaller jazz units that had come up from uh, New Orleans, then to Chicago, and then to New York. The big bands with Ellington and, uh, and with Goodman and with the Dorseys and with Glenn Miller that I can think of quickly um, brought in a kind of a new sound. It was the big band organized with, uh, with arrangers and with uh, glamour girls. I give you the Eberly Brothers sang, the men uh, uh, vocalists. Sinatra and and some of those people uh, who had become big stars. The uh, the radio uh, expansion at the time, Rudy Valley was the biggest thing in show business from 1930, I'd say, to 1941-42 with the Fleischmann Yeast Hour. He introduced people like uh, Kate Smith and Eddie Cantor. Those had never existed before. They didn't even know enough to play a theme song. Rudy inter introduced that, mm -hmm. uh, that innovation uh, uh, on the air. All of that uh, is looked back in hallowed memory. The only thing that bothers me is why didn't we pass it on to the kids? But I think one of the reasons was television. The, the, that hungry eye, you know, ate up all the material. You had to have new material. Every season came around. The kids saw everything there was on the horizon and up front. Uh, there was no, there was no point almost to to going to see a, 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 an Ellington. You saw him four times in the course of mm -hmm. two years on specials. You saw Ella Fitzgerald, and on public television you saw the the pantomimists, and you saw uh, the educational uh, uh, programs that brought uh, the specials. Uh, Les Brown and his band of renown with with Bob Hope. You saw all that on specials, so that there was no point. And then the dancing chains, so yeah. there was no need. You, you could just stand and dance by yourself. Yeah. So all of that was a, was a tremendous change. But we remember it with, with great warmth because it was our time and it was our era. Uh, then, uh, of course, uh, starting with Elvis, uh, he, here comes the Beatles, and, and here come some of the groups that really made mar uh, Neil Diamond made marvelous music. I think of the Beatles with Michelle Mabel and... Uh, and I believe in yesterday's with cellos. The music is absolutely beautiful. And you think of, uh, I remember uh, seeing on TV Elvis and that Hawaiian uh, telecast in which uh, the crowd absolutely goes wild over him. He has probably 40 people on the stand. 
Uh, it's, it was a far cry from yeah. three or four men with a guitar. But he was a competitor for you. In a moment, <laughs> we'll get back to this, and I want to have just kind of a brief insight by uh, recreating for a few moments some of the music of that day. We take this brief break, and we'll be right back with George Arrestus. <laughs> Here's the background of music from Glenn Miller's recording of String of Pearls. This is the kind of music which the Fenton Brothers made, huh? Yes, indeed. Uh, we, uh, by the time uh, we had, ex by that time, we had expanded to five saxophones, three trumpets, three trombones, uh, drums, bass, guitar, and piano, girl singer, boy singer, and leader, and two people working in the bus and setting up the band. Uh, that arrangement that you've just heard uh, was available in what we call stock arrangements. Uh, the funny part of it was I had a man named Benny Leonard who uh, was a marvelous pianist and he copied Song of India by Tommy Dorsey. It took him about a month and a half because you'd play the record and, and work it at the same uh, work it at the same speed as the key that the, it was written in and then the week after he copied it, <laughs> the stock came out for, for a dollar and a quarter <laughs> and Benny went out of his mind. That's it, the way it is, huh? <laughs> yes, indeed. Well, you got somebody on the line. Let's go to a line. Good morning. Good morning. I just wanted to call and say you sure I'm bringing back a lot of memories this morning. Well, it's our, it really is our pleasure because uh, to reminisce, I think, is good for the soul. Oh, I've danced all the big bands out to the pier at Old Arches and the Palace and Ricker Gardens. And, oh, my, what a good time we had then. You yes. fondly remember. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot anyway. Thank you for calling. Bye-bye. Bye now. Let me ask you this question. Will the big bands ever come back? I, not as we knew them. I don't think so. It's hard to keep a band together unless it's working. The payrolls are uh, uh, for some of these good musicians, and the youngsters are marvelous, better than ever uh, musicians. Uh, the, the payroll is prohibitive, and to uh, bring uh, people on the road and have them stay overnight in hotels and that kind of thing, you can hardly gross enough money unless it's the college circuit. Now, under the cultural programs of the colleges, uh, then you can have... Uh, uh, a band with say 18 or 20 people and a bus, a Greyhound that you that you charter and go from city to city. But it's a it's a it's a booked series uh, of uh, one night or two night stands. Uh, what usually happens is you play the concert and then the next day the soloists are visited by the various musicians in the college bands, the marching bands, and so it makes a two or three day stand, which makes it very very good. And the colleges are, are almost contiguous; they're next to each other, and the jumps aren't that bad. For that kind of, of, uh, of, uh, of a program, you can get uh, bands together. But uh, the way we knew it, uh, with the big bands playing the hotels and, and staying, say, uh, at the Lock Cabin in Armour, New York for, for a month, or at the Glen Island Casino for a month, those, those days are gone. You feel sorry for the younger generation that did not know it? Yes, in a way I do. I wish they had seen it and, and shared it with us. But they have their own kicks and their own, their own groups, and I'm sure they'll, they'll look back. It'll change, and they'll look back on their days and say, those were the days. They'll yeah. fondly remember, too, in, in, <laughs> Indeed. In, in such a way as that. Huh? We have somebody on the line. Very quickly, we'll pick up a phone call. Good morning. Good morning. You know why I'm calling you? I am uh, one of Norman's best friends. Tell him I'm the old lady from Wayne. 91 years old now, huh? <laughs> yes. Yeah. I want to speak to this gentleman that's the band leader. I, are you talking about Red Elvin? I certainly am. Red was my lead saxophone player and one of the nicest men I have ever met. He moved to Washington, and I've kind of lost track of him. I'm going to let you two talk because I've got to sign off right now, but right after the broadcast. I want to thank you, George, for coming in this morning. My it's pleasure. been a delight. Would you come back again? We'll do another show on, on Later music? Later on, be okay. delighted to. Okay, very good. George, arrest this, and if you'll just hold on, Maude, we'll put you back in conversation with him. Yeah. Tomorrow, we will be doing a show which is one of our, our uh, regular uh, weekly activities, and that happens to be a swap shop. So all of you swap shoppers can join us this morning, even though you didn't join us in conversation on the phone today. George, again, thank you. Thank you. Tomorrow at 930.